Arya heard a soft knock at the door. Arya, her father's voice called out. Open the door. We need to talk. Father was alone. He seemed more sad than angry. That made Arya feel even worse. May I come in? Arya nodded. Whose sword is that? Hi everybody! I am Yuki Dron, and welcome to another of our re-reading videos of a Game of Thrones from the A Song of Ice and Fire series, doing deep dives into what the chapters have to offer. For some chapters it could be history, in others it's politics, and in this chapter, Arya 2 of A Game of Thrones, the 23rd chapter of the book, it's about a surprisingly gentle and sweet father-daughter relationship. If this is your first time here, subscribe to our channel and click the bell to make sure you don't miss out on our upcoming rereading videos. So, Arya 2. In my eyes, this is one of the most beautiful chapters so far. Full of tenderness and kindness. Things you wouldn't normally expect from an Arya chapter, so I think we need to rethink the Arya character. There's also a lot of fatherly love from Lord Eddard Stark to his sweet, sweet daughter. I was surprised by how sensitive Arya is, in contrast to how outwardly unrestrained she is, full of outbursts and rough edges. And her sensitivity is not only internal, she's also very attuned to her surroundings. The quote I read at the beginning of the video shows that she can clearly read her father's face and tone and we will see during this video that she uses those skills not to manipulate but to enhance their understanding of each other. She loves her father dearly, she appreciates him and she doesn't take his presence for granted. This chapter reminded me how much I love book Arya. And as a father myself to a nine-year-old girl, this chapter really moved me. It stirred my feelings. Yes, I have feelings. Anyway, Arya's sensitivity is further enhanced when you contrast it with Sansa's self-centeredness and classic teenage narcissism. The older star girl is more cultured, more refined and better educated but she is oblivious to anything and everything in the world outside of her little bubble of good princes and gallant knights. We know that Sansa takes after her Southron mother. Arya takes more after her father, or more accurately, after her independent-minded and willful Aunt Lyanna. Ned points out this similarity. What makes Arya such an engaging character is that on top of being, as her dad says, independent-minded and willful, she's also tender, understanding and mature beyond her years. For example, the chapter starts with this. Her father had been fighting with the council again. Arya could see it on his face when he came to the table, as he had been so often. So right off the bat, we see that she's attentive to her father's emotions and she's been for a time. It's important to her. Can you imagine a Sansa chapter starting with her looking and reading her father's face? Nah. -uh. Then Arya goes on to describe how life in the Great Hall of Winterfell was like, ah, Winterfell, back in the day. Ah, there was a shared sense of purpose, camaraderie between different kinds of men. Arya's brothers were there, and she misses them so much. In Winterfell, her father made sure to have someone else who worked at Winterfell next to him in most meals to learn about their job and areas of expertise. Arya lists off a long list of dinner guests who would go on and on about their horses or their weapons or whatever else they have going on. Apparently, Arya loved to witness her dad talk shop over the family dinner table. I must say, it sure sounds that Eddie Stark was a very wise and effective lord of Winterfell. Arya points out that he was always interested in what his men had to say, and she often heard him mentor Rob for the job, a mentorship Ned himself never had. So he had to learn the job on the fly. Here's a good quote. Her father used to say that a lord needed to eat with his men if he hoped to keep them. Know the men who follow you, she heard him tell Rob once, and let them know you. 
Don't ask your man to die for a stranger. Wise, wise words. Arya goes on to describe the fighting men in the north. Free riders as tough as leather, courtly knights and bold young squires, grizzled old men at arms. Arya played boyish games with them. They called her Arya Underfoot and not Arya Horseface. So the male world was nicer and more, wel and more welcoming to her. The female world of Sansa, Jane Poole and Septa Mordain made her feel that she didn't belong because she doesn't belong. Now everything was changed, Arya said. Now she hated listening to the men, hated everything they did and thought them cowards for not stepping up to the queen, letting her kill Lady and letting, and letting the hound kill Micah without any repercussions. Nobody had said a freaking word about it. Looking back, it seems to her that they all talked a bold game when they didn't need to back it up with actions. So she's going through some growing pains now and is learning the hard way. The grown-up world is unjust, that her father is not an all-powerful god, and that warriors are no match for a queen. In contrast to the Winterfell Great Hall, in King's Landing, Ned is relegated to the Small Hall, because the Great Hall is for the king. The Small Hall has high vaulted ceilings and makes Arya feel estranged. We do learn that the Starks have their own private retinue of 50 Northmen. This is another reminder of this feudal system's fundamental flaw. Each warlord with his own private militia. What could go wrong? So, as we learned in the previous Ned chapter, the tourney for the Hand of the King is on. Ned is less than joyful about it. And he doesn't feel honored at all. Jory Cassell says, Knights will come from all over the realm to joust and feast in honor of your appointment as the Hand of the King. Arya immediately knows where her father stands about it. But Sansa? Hmm. Sansa's eyes had grown wide as the plates. Attorney? She breathed. She had seated between Septa Mordain and Jane Poole as far from Arya as she could get without drawing a reproach from father. Will we be permitted to go, father? Sansa's courtesies and good manners are actually a mask that hides her lack of sensitivity. Ned doesn't want his daughters to go, but Septa Mordain interjects. All the ladies of the court will be expected at a grand event like this, and as the attorney is in your honor, it would look queer if your family did not attend. Father look pained, Arya thinks. I suppose so, very well. And Arya, what does she have to say? I don't care about this stupid tourney, Arya said. <sighs> she knew Prince Joffrey would be there and she hated Prince Joffrey. Sansa lifted her head. It will be a splendid event. You shan't be wanted. Anger flashed across father's face. So Sansa and Arya have always been as different as the moon and the sun in their father's words. But as long as they were in Winterfell, both of them had their own place in the world. King's Landing, though, is Sansa land, as far as both of them are concerned. Now the clashes are inevitable. Sansa has Jane and the Septa and Joffrey. Arya has no one. After the tired Ned left the dinner table to his room, Arya looked around the hall. She saw Sansa across the table with her friends. She saw the men laughing, and Arya was all by herself, lonely, an outsider. No one talked to Arya. She didn't care. She liked it that way. She would have eaten her meals alone in the bedchamber if they let her. So what triggered Ned to leave the dinner table was the ongoing spat between his two daughters. He scolded them, saying that he is weary to the death of this endless war you two are fighting. The reaction of the two girls is a polar opposite. Sansa nodded and Arya lowered her head and almost cried. So Sansa is reacting politely and Arya is reacting emotionally. She is a sensitive tomboy. How wonderful of her. <laughs> but she's also determined not to cry. She will only cry when she's safe in her room behind lock and key. Arya blames herself for the killing of her friend Micah, the butcher's boy. In her room, she looked at the window, 
hating them all and herself most of all. It was all her fault, everything bad that had happened. Sansa said so, and Jane too. Ugh, how cruel. She retells a gruesome story of how the Hound delivered Micah's cut-up body to his father in a bag, and that the butcher had initially thought it a cut-up pig when it took the bag from the hands of his killer. Even her father didn't do anything. No one really cared about a dead butcher's boy. His low station makes him less important for the Starks than Direwolf. Then Arya chucks away beautiful clothes from her case to gently pick up Neil. Grabbing handfuls of silk and satin and velvet and wool and tossing them on the floor. It was there at the bottom of the chest where she'd hidden it. Arya lifted it almost tenderly and drew the slender blade from its sheath. Needle. If Needle is Arya, that's the kind of treatment she needs. She needs to be held tenderly. She dreams of running away from everybody, stealing some food and roaming and looking for Nymeria to head to Winterfell or the Wall. Foreshadowing much? So the main scene in the chapter is when Ned knocks softly on the door. Arya lets him in and he sees Needle in Arya's hand. Give it to me. Reluctantly, Arya surrendered her sword, wondering if she would ever hold it again. Then her father does the whole wine connoisseur thing when they're tasting wine. Hmm? Only he does it with needle, looking at it from all kinds of angles and recognizing the work of his weapons maker, Mikan. Busted. When he confronts Arya about it, Arya could not lie. She lowered her eyes. Lord Eddard Stark sighed. <sighs> my nine-year-old daughter is being armed from my own forge and I know nothing of it. The Hand of the King is expected to rule the Seven Kingdoms, yet it seems I cannot even rule my own household. Uh, I must say, Ned, uh, the King cannot rule his own household either, and neither could uh, your, <laughs> your predecessor as Hand, hmm? John Arryn, and even the guy before that, Tywin Lannister, could not uh, rule his own house, so hmm, you're in good company. Arya would not snitch to Ned about who made the sword. She would not betray John, not even to their father. Ned, the attentive father he is, doesn't persist. He quickly senses that loyalty to her brother is a good quality in Stark. So when Arya says she hates Sansa Stark and the Septa, Ned gets mad. Pity the Septa that has been charged with the impossible task of making you a lady. I don't want to be a lady, Arya flared. Ned wants to break Needle, the toy, he calls it, but quickly comes down and tells her her willful nature reminds him of his dead siblings, Brandon and Lyanna. And Arya is startled by that. She says, but Lyanna was beautiful. When Ned speaks of Brandon and Lyanna, Arya heard the sadness in his voice. He did not often speak of his father or of the brother and sister who had died before she was born. The climax comes when she brings up Micah. Arya desperately wanted to explain to make him see. I was trying to learn, but her eyes filled with tears. I asked Micah to practice with me. The grief came on her all at once. She turned away, shaking. I asked him, she cried. It was my fault. It was me. Suddenly, her father's arms were around her. He held her gently as she turned to him and sobbed against his chest. No, sweet one, he murmured. Grieve for your friend, but never blame yourself. You did not kill the butcher's boy. That murder lies at the hound's door, him and the cruel woman he serves. I hate them, Arya confided. And then she said that Joffrey and Sansa lied. And Ned is again surprisingly wise. We all lie, her father said. Or did you truly think I'd believe that Nymeria ran off? So Jory didn't snitch about it, but Ned himself was sensitive enough to understand. Even a blind man could see that Wolf would never have left you willingly. Then she tells her dad how she made Nymeria leave by throwing rocks at her. It was right, her father said. And even your lie was... 
not without honor. So Father Ned was in this interaction sensitive and understanding, strict when he had to, and gave Arya a useful narrative about the very traumatic murder of her friend, and that will protect her emotional well-being. And now he's going to teach her about the world. Ned walks to the window, contemplates, and makes a decision. He doesn't want to burden her, but he feels that there are things she needs to know. Let me tell you something about wolves, child. When the snows fall and the white winds blow, the lone wolf dies, but the pack survive. Summer is the time for squabbles. In winter, we must protect each other, keep each other warm, share our strengths. So if you must hate Arya, hate those who would truly do us harm. Septa Mordain is a good woman and Sansa... Sansa is your sister. He sounded so tired that it made Arya sad. I don't hate Sansa, she told him. Notice that he didn't say that Sansa is a good person. Ned speaks to her of their house words winter is coming and it makes a general point of it it's not only about the season winter but the hard cruel times and he tells her that all her childish endeavors and her outbursts these are summer things now that bran has fallen now that there is danger in winterfell when they're surrounded by people who wish them ill this is time for families to stick together, and he expects her to grow up. I will, Arya vowed. She had never loved him so much as she did in that instant. I can be strong too. I can be as strong as Rob. Then he gives her back needle. The next morning, Arya apologized to Septa Mordain. Three days later, she started training with Syria Forel. Great parenting by Ned, remarkable maturity by Arya, emotional writing by George. This is it. This was a beautiful chapter. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button. And I want to, as always, thank our patrons for supporting our work. Thank you for listening. We'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody.